All right. Uh, if you've looked at the web page, um, you'll notice I put up some uh, an R script already, a little video, 10 or 15 minute video on how to do um, uh, the randomized complete block design. Uh, so that's already up. Uh, I want to make a point about um, the ANOVA that, you're, that you've done uh, this past week. Okay. Um, and I think you and I already talked, somebody, I talked about with somebody about that. Um, there's a, when you do, um, well, let me get organized. Let's write down what the model is. Um, our model was yij equals mu plus alpha i plus epsilon ij. Okay, where alpha was the treatment, and epsilon was the error. So our treatments were the fertilizer combinations, right? Um, and then we estimated all of these things. We, sub we replaced mu with our best estimate of mu, which was y bar dot dot. Uh, we replaced alpha i with um, uh, mu, uh, or I'm sorry, uh, y i dot bar minus y bar dot dot. And then we replaced epsilon with uh, y i j minus y i dot bar. Okay? We add everything up, square both sides, and that then gives us our sums of squares in the ANOVA table. When you put it, depending on how you in, got the data into R, into R, um, and I discovered this, uh, I, I ran the analysis first in R, and I looked at the ANOVA table that it produced, and I said right away, well, that's all right. Um, the degrees of freedom were wrong for, um, for treatment. Uh, instead of having, or rather, um, for, for blocks, I did it for the block design. Uh, I noticed right away that the degrees of freedom were incorrect. Um, and I then realized what was happening. In R, we're using uh, the LM uh, function, right, which is linear models. A linear model is something like that. That's the equation of a line. So it's a regression, okay? In a regression analysis, all the variables are not always, but usually all of the variables are continuous. In analysis of variance, that treatment is not continuous. It's discrete. It's a categorical variable. We have fertilizer treatment one, fertilizer treatment two, fertilizer treatment three. Right? and the control. So we have four different fertilizer treatments in our first, our completely randomized design. In the block design that we're going to do today, we have three treatments, I think, whatever. But, right, they're categorical variables. In linear modeling, it assumes that everything is continuous. So if your categories are labeled with numbers, one, two, three, four, five, it's going to treat that as a continuous variable, and it's going to say, oh, this person is doing a regression analysis. And now, instead of giving you the appropriate now three degrees of freedom for treatments, or four degrees, whatever it happens to be, it gives you one degree of freedom for treatment, okay? So the point is we have to be careful when we're doing linear models, then we have to remember that we're gonna have to specify which variables are continuous and which ones are categorical. And when I do the next ANOVA for you, provide, provide you with that next script, I will show you how to do that, okay? So what that means is for now, when you import your data, Make sure if you have a treatment effect that you call the values there, not one, two, treatment, one, two, three, four, five, that you call it treatment one, treatment two, treatment three, treatment four, or group A, B, C, D, E, something like that, 
so that it will know that it's a categorical variable. I think the way around that is instead of using LM, we could use the AOV command instead, which now tells it that this is an analysis of variance. And now, if I do that, that's going to be treated, even if I'm using 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, that will be treated as a categorical variable. variable. So I will show you how to do that on the, next, um, on the next little video that I put up. So this is where we were last time. Uh, and you should have gotten an ANOVA table that matched very closely what we did in class. Okay? What we're going to do today is expand on that whole idea just a little bit. Okay? Uh, we're going to stick with... Um, da -da -da. We're going to stick with one-way analysis of variance. But we're going to introduce a new kind of problem. So for the next couple of weeks, all we're doing are the simplest kind of ANOVAs. We're doing one-way ANOVA. The first ANOVA that we did, the one we did last week, is a CRD ANOVA, completely randomized design. What we're going to do today is a RCB ANOVA, which stands for Randomized Complete Block Design. All right? If we still have energy, we will also do something called a Latin Square. After we do the Latin square, we're going to do a nested design. In years past, what I would have done is I would have stayed with this completely randomized design for a little while longer, and I would have done something sort of interesting. I would have done something called a planned... How many ends does planned have? One or two? I think just one. Planned, planned, planned contrast. What is a planned contrast? It's pretty interesting. When you do an analysis of variance, as you did for the fertilizer data, right? What you discovered was there is a difference between fertilizer treatments. But what you don't know is where the difference is. All you know is that the treatments are not equal. There's a difference between those treatments. You can look at your box plots and say, oh, hey, this treatment has the highest value, so that must be the one that's best. Alternatively, what we like to do is we do what's called an a posteriori test. A posteriori. a posteriori test. That means after the fact. A posteriori, posterior, means behind, so afterwards. So after we've done the analysis, we're going to go back with a different statistical test and try and pinpoint where the difference is. Okay? And I will do that for you on the assignment that you get today. I will post another little video showing you how to do that. Okay. The, typically, the trick that we, the test that we use is called the Tukey HSD test. Tukey, John Tukey, the same guy who developed the box plots. Okay. HSD stands for honestly significant difference. And what he's doing is he's recognizing that we live in a Bayesian world. By doing the ANOVA, you've discovered that there is a difference in your data somewhere. And now, after you know that there is a difference, you're going back to try and find out where the difference is. 
the probability of finding out where the difference is is higher now because you know one is there. It's just like me going around with a, the hat full of ping pong balls. You pull out a red ping pong ball, oh, you now know that, hey, there are red balls in there. So the probability of a red ping pong ball is no longer zero. It's something different, okay? So Tukey takes that into account. So you can do this honestly significant difference test to find out where the difference lies. The problem with doing that is that it has low statistical power. You would be better off doing an a priori test. An a priori test is the one that you do beforehand. Okay. If you look at the ANOVA table, you have source, you have treatment, error, and then total. And then you have some of you have degrees of freedom, and on the assignment that you did, we had four fertilizers. We had a control and three fertilizers. I think that was right on the data set. So, how many degrees of freedom did you have associated with treatment? You had three. If you think about it, all these things are additive. The number of treatment degrees of freedom plus the number of air degrees of freedom equals the total degrees of freedom. The sum of squares for treatments plus the sum of squares for error equals the total sum of squares. The model is additive. So I can think of my ANOVA as occupying a space in linear algebra terms. I can subdivide that space into various dimensions. I have three treatment degrees of freedom. That means I have three dimensions for treatment. So I can, de because it's additive, I can decompose that treatment into three separate orthogonal vectors. What does orthogonal mean? In a spatial sense, it means perpendicular. In statistics, it means independent. Okay? So I can decompose that treatment variable into three independent axes, which means I can test three independent hypotheses about treatments. That's my a priori test. The difficulty is it's going to require that I plan ahead. That's why it's called a planned contrast. So ahead of time, before I do the ANOVA, I'm going to say, all right, I'm going to test this against this, this against this, and this against this. And the only thing I have to do is make sure that those three hypotheses are orthogonal, independent. And the way we do that is by assigning coefficients to each parameter and then getting the dot product, and if the dot product is equal to zero, we know that they're independent. Going through all of that development generally takes me about an hour and a half. The nice thing about doing that is because about an hour into it, I say, hey, wait, we could do this. And then I switch gears a little bit and show you that we could actually turn this into a regression problem so I use it as a way of showing you the similarity between regression and ANOVA. In the 38 years that I've been teaching this class and the hundreds of graduate students that I've taught, I have yet to find a single graduate student that used planned contrasts in an ANOVA design. In all the years that I've been editing for the Journal of Mammalogy, I have not yet encountered a single paper where somebody used planned contrasts. That tells me that it's simply too much work for the basic biologist. Okay? So we're going to skip it. I give up. 
I've thrown up the white flag. I'll provide you with the notes, okay, so that you can keep it in your files and you can see how to do it, right? And you'll, it is very cool if, if you like linear algebra, if you like math a little bit. It's very cool. It's very awesome. And it's extremely powerful. It's much more powerful than the a posteriori test. But everybody does a posteriori test because they're easy and you don't have to think about it. Unfortunately, they're not nearly as powerful. All right, I've thrown up the white flag. We're not going to do that. You now know about it at least. Sometime in the future, some employer is going to say, boy, we just need a little more statistical power. And you're going to say, hey, I have an idea. Let me think about this. Let me solve work on this a little bit. I think I can come up with a design that will do that for us. And then you'll go back to your notes and pull out those pages on planned contrast. You'll come back and you'll show it to this guy and they'll think you're brilliant. They'll give you a pay raise and you'll go out and buy yourself a brand new Corvette and a bigger house and all that. It'll be great. Okay. Years ago, totally aside, years ago, I had a grad student in here and uh, he was married, he ultimately was married to another graduate student who was my graduate student. And uh, the only math, the only statistics course he ever had was my experimental design course. And back in the days when I was making a lot less than I make now, he got a job at Drexel University. He just had the master's degree, but he got a job at Drexel University teaching experimental design my class. And they were paying him twice what they were paying me. And this is the only stats class. And I was so pissed. I was so upset. <laughs> Life is not fair. But who knows? It might work out for you. Someday you'll be driving the Corvette, big house. It'll be great. Pool in the backyard. Single malt scotch. <laughs> on the kitchen counter, available every day. It'll be great. All right, let's do this. Let's think of a problem. Let's imagine Jennifer Weber was still here, OK? The woman who set up the greenhouses. And we have a brilliant idea for a master's project. We want to work on plants. And we're going to grow these plants in the greenhouse. Maybe. You love Anaheim green chilies, like I do. You say, God, I want to perfect the green chilies, figure out exactly how to water them and fertilize them so that I can maximize my yield on Anaheim green chilies. And you're going to do this as my graduate student. It'll be great. I love green chilies. And I say, this will be wonderful. We can do it in the greenhouse. So here's our greenhouse. Okay, and there's the north side of the greenhouse, and there's the south side of the greenhouse. And we set up two benches in the greenhouse. One bench there, and one <coughs> bench there. And now what we want to do is we want to apply a certain treatment, okay? How should we organize our treatments. Um, randomly, not all in the. So we'll, we'll. All right, so maybe we've got four treatments treatment A, B, C, and D. Okay? Okay. So I'm going to divide my benches in half. I'm going to put treatment A there, C there, D there and be there. Okay? I randomized. I mean, I should have used a little random number generator, but maybe that's just how it came out. Sound like a good idea? Okay? What's wrong with that idea? Remember what we're doing. We're thinking about y i j is equal to mu plus alpha i plus epsilon i j, okay? Where 
This is the error. And this is our treatment. So that's our treatment, A, B, C, or D, okay? And what's the statistical test that we're doing? We're looking at, basically, this compared to that. I mean, right? Mm -hmm. We're looking at that compared to that. So in some sense, not exactly, but very simple, we're comparing those two. So if alpha is big, then that ratio is going to be greater than 1. Or if epsilon is really small, that ratio will be a bigger number. Mm -hmm. So the way we're going to get a significant result, and I know we want to be honest, we want to be fair, but remember, we want power. We want statistical power. We want to maximize our chance of finding a difference if one exists. So what we want to do is we want to do everything we can in order to make epsilon as small as possible. If we make epsilon small, then this ratio is going to be big. And that's what we want, because that will give us a bigger F. So how can we make epsilon small? Well, one way we can do it is by increasing the sample size. Oh, but we're graduate students. We don't have a lot of money. As a matter of fact, we don't have any money. We're begging for green chili seeds, and we're begging for space in the greenhouse, and we're begging somebody to donate us some fertilizer. We're groveling in the dirt trying to get this stuff done. So what do we do? We have barely just enough to get this thing set up. But we're worried, OK? What can we do to make epsilon smaller? Because there's something going on in this greenhouse. What's going on? Well, I know there's probably going to be some kind of effect as a result of the fertilizer. Otherwise, I wouldn't be testing the fertilizers. Well, look at the greenhouse. Maybe living in Missouri, you don't think about these things. You ever been in New Mexico or Colorado and seen an adobe house? And the south-facing wall has what's called a trown wall. It's just a wall of, so you have the adobe wall, and in front of that, about a foot and a half, two feet in front of it, is another wall made out of glass. What the heck's that all about? It's always the south-facing wall. Well, let's see. Glass is either polarized or the glass is going to have a shade. So in the summertime, you drop a shade to keep the light off of the adobe, which will keep the house cooler. It's say, facing south. In the wintertime, you keep the shades up. You let the sun come in, and it heats up all that air right between the, the adobe and the, and the glass. So now you have this nice insulating layer okay. on the so you're using it for temperature control. Mm -hmm. Now what's it going to be like in this greenhouse? Here's the south bench, there's the north bench. Which bench is going to be hotter? The south bench is going to be hotter. Because that one is getting more direct sunlight. This one is going to be warmer than that one. So which side is going to have more photosynthesis? South. The south one is going to have more photosynthesis. So in other words, you're going to get more growth here with D and B than with A and C. Mm -hmm. Where does that variability show up in the model? Air. It shows up here. Mm -hmm. So now this is smaller. So now even though you might have a difference, you might not find it. That, ladies and gentlemen, is the crux of the biscuit. That's the apostrophe, okay? As Frank Zappa would say. So what do we do? Instead of uh, four plots, maybe make it eight, 16? Hey, there's the thought.
C, B, A, D, A, C, B, D, something like that. Have we solved the problem? No. Because these guys still are going to be different than these guys up here. They're still going to have, so this D has more photosynthesis than that one. That B has more photosynthesis than that one. And would you average the two? Doesn't make any difference. Some, I have more noise. I have more error. And that goes right in there. So somehow what I have to do is I have to get that noise out of that term. I have to find a way to subtract it out. So if you're expecting more growth in the south side, could you um, just subtract the amount of growth that you had from the south side or find the difference between the growth in the south side and the north side, and then kind of cut that. You're, you're on the right track. You're on, you're on the right track. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to change my model. This is what this class is all about. This is what it comes down to. It's, it's simple. It's easy. All we're going to do is we're going to take the model and we're going to rewrite it. Yij equals u plus alpha i. But now I have a different thing going on in there. I have these benches. Instead of calling them benches, let me call them blocks. So plus beta, okay, what's my subscript? Beta j plus epsilon ij. So now what I'm doing is I'm taking the error that I have here in my error term, and some of it is going over there, and I'm going to put some of it in there. That's what I want to do. Because now, because I've taken away some of the noise out of this error term, that error term is now smaller. So when I compare that to that, I have a better, because that's smaller now, I have a better chance of finding the difference. It's that easy. So, just like before, I'm going to assume that the sum of all the alpha i's is equal to zero. And I'm going to assume that the sum of all the beta j's is equal to zero. So, yeah, I'm really looking at the difference from one side to the other. I'm looking at the effect of bench, of block, on my results, and I'm subtracting okay. that variability out. And then I have to assume that my epsilon ij's are identically normally distributed with mean zero and variance sigma e squared. But that's the same assumption that we had before. Okay? All right. Now, an important point. I'm going to assume that there is no interaction between treatment and bench, between treatment and block. Okay? In other words, Being treatment C, regardless of what you, of what bench you're on. I'm sorry. Being on treatment C on bench on the north bench versus the south bench is the same effect as treatment B north versus south. In other words, the bench has the same effect on each treatment. Okay. It's not always going to be true. You can think of lots of physiological examples in animals where 
different animals respond very differently to water deprivation or food deprivation or whatever, okay? But we have to make that assumption. We don't want, we want the effective bench to be the same for each fertilizer treatment that we're going to use. Let me show you what I mean by that. What I, what I mean in a very real way is that the model is going to be additive. So let me use an example, okay? <coughs> Let's imagine I have two treatments. I have treatment one and treatment two. Let's imagine I have three blocks. I have block one, I have block two, and I have block three. Okay, so this is, instead of four treatments on two blocks, I now have two treatments on three blocks. Just different example. Let's imagine that I have an overall mean mu of 20. So my model is yij equals mu plus alpha i plus um, beta j plus epsilon ij. So mu is 20. The effect of treatment one is a plus one. So alpha, alpha one is plus one, alpha two is minus one. Alpha one is plus one, alpha two is minus one. Alpha one is plus one, alpha two is minus one. Okay? Let's imagine block one has the effect of plus two. Block two has the effect of plus five. And block three has the effect of minus seven. Notice what's going on. Treatment plus one, minus one, plus one, plus a minus one is equal to zero. Block, plus two, plus five, minus seven is equal to zero. So the sum of the alphas is equal to zero, the sum of the betas is equal to zero, okay? So what do those numbers give me? This gives me 23. This gives me 21, this gives me 26, this one gives me 24, this one gives me 14, and this one gives me 12. Okay. So let's make a little graph now. How shall I do this graph? I'm going to do treatment one versus treatment two, and I'm going to have block one, block two, and block three. I'm going to draw two lines, and this is going to be the yield. Okay? So now for treatment one, I've got, what are my numbers? All of, from, 40, from 12, up, my biggest number is 26. So I'm gonna make this 10, 20, 30, that's 15, that's 25. Okay, for block one, treatment one, block one, I have 23. Treatment one, block two, I have 26. 
Treatment one, block three, I have 14. All right, now let's do treatment two. Treatment two, block one, I have 21. Treatment two, block two, I have 24. Treatment two, block three, I have 12. The lines do not cross, okay? Mm -hmm. In other words, I'm good. I have no interaction. So there is no interaction between treatment and block. The block effect, right, that difference is essentially the same for both treatments. Okay? Good. Let's change the numbers a little bit. Again, we're going to have the overall mean of 20. The treatment effects are going to be the same. So let's erase that part of it. So it's 20 plus 1, 20 minus 1. Okay. But now, uh, let's see. For block 1, we get plus 2. Here we get plus 2. Uh, here we get minus 2. Oh, plus 5 and plus 5. And over here we get minus 7. And then we're going to get minus 9, plus 4, minus 2, plus 2. And plus 6 and minus 6. And now what we get is that equals 19. This one equals 25. Here we get 24 and 26. And here we get 20 and 6. So now let's graph those. So treatment one, we get 19, right there, then 24, it's up there, and block three is 20, so we're right there. So there's treatment one. Now let's do treatment two, we get 25, right there, 26, right there, and the last one is six, oops, we're way down there. Notice the lines cross. So we have an interaction term. What's different? That thing right there. So there's another source of variability in there. What is that source of variability? That's the interaction between block and treatment. OK? So the effect of the block on the treatments is not equal across them all. It's different. So the model is non-additive. We're assuming that our system doesn't do that. How can we figure out whether we have additivity or not additivity? Easy. Just make the graph, right? Make that little graph. As long as the lines don't cross, you're golden. You're good. All right. Let's do an example. And these are the same numbers that show up in the little video clip that I've already posted. Uh, these data are for um, auger plates that came out of an incubator. Uh, so it's a little microbiology sort of a thing. And what we're doing is looking at the number of plates uh, that come out of this incubator that exhibit no growth. Uh, so it turns out that in this incubator, we have five shelves. Uh, so we're going to say we have five blocks. We have five of them. We have block number one, two, three, four, five. Why am I blocking 
by shelf. I don't know what incubators are like today, but when I was in microbiology all those years ago, back in the mid-1970s, early 1970s, um, the temperature inside the incubator wasn't very well regulated. So the temperature at the top of the incubator was always warmer than the temperature at the bottom of the incubator. And it wasn't like it is today where you get the nice digital readout of what the temperature is. You actually had to jam a thermometer or something in there to get a reading. So uh, the incubators of you know, 40, 50 years ago just weren't like they are today. So we have uh, a number of treatments. We have a control. We have treatment one, and we have treatment two. Okay, and the numbers are 3.74, 4.47. Uh, these data are already on the web page, so you don't have to write them down. Okay, and then 5.65. And in fact, if you take the, you'll be guaranteed that the numbers are right. Okay, I've double checked them, triple checked them, quadruple checked them. Uh, the numbers on the spreadsheet are good. Uh, 4.58, 6.78, and 7.00. And for block three, we have 4.58, 5.19. Uh, these values are the, um, they're the natural logs of the number of no growth plates. 6.08, we have 4.47, 5.19, and 5.74, and here we have 4.79, <coughs> 6.85, and 7.55. So the average of number of no growth log, natural log of number of no growth plates uh, is 4.432, here it's 5.696, and here it's 6.404. Then the average across blocks uh, here is 4.620, 6.680, 6.680, Five point two eight three, five point one three three, and six point three nine seven. And then the overall mean is five point five one one. So that is equal to y bar dot dot. So those are the data. And what you're going to do is you're going to take those data and enter it into R. Okay, so you're going to use the choose file. You're going to, it's already as a CSV file, so you download the file on the web page, uh, put it on in your directory, whatever directory you're using, access it by using the choose.file command, okay? Um, Go to the dialog box, select that file, open up. It's already a CSV file, and you're ready to go. As a side note, uh, you'll recall that last time uh, for that data set, that initial data set that I put up, uh, for the completely randomized design, when I had species, I had this weird sort of name for species. So in the CSV file, it said species, but when R opened it up, it said one with an umlaut over the top, dot, dot, and then species. Now I've been wondering, why the hell did it do that? And I've gone back and forth, copied and pasted it, and it's always the same answer. The difference is, when you save a file in Excel, and you want to save it as a CSV file, there are multiple possible CSV formats. The first one that pops up is not necessarily the one you want. You want the CSV format for MS-DOS. As soon as you do that, everything works. So just a word of caution. Yeah, I, what I did was I just went to the Excel file and then changed it to a different format. I think it was like Excel workbook or worksheet. Yeah. And then I threw it in R and then it kind of 
solved itself. Yeah, yeah. But that that's the that's the that's the issue. Okay. All right. So your those data are ready to go. You can open them up and you're ready to do the analysis. And now all we have to do is understand the analysis. So let's do that. Oh well you can first of all notice by looking at these block values that they vary by quite a bit. So you know that some of these blocks are different. And you know, looking at these values, that the control is different from treatment one. So you can see that there is something going on in these data. So when you, when you do this, the first thing, obviously, is to do the box plots. So your very first part of your program is going to be the box plots. So recall, our model now is yij equals u plus alpha i plus beta j, that's our block, plus epsilon ij. I just sent a paper back uh, that I edited where the guy did an ANOVA design, not a block design, it was a different design. And I can't tell what the heck he did. I can't figure out, he claims it's a certain kind of ANOVA, and I look at his values, and I cannot figure out what the hell he's done. And I'm pretty sure he's done it wrong. So I send him back a, a little note, and I say, what I need to see is your ANOVA model. And his response, he had no idea what I was talking about. So he claims to have done what's called a nested design, so I send him back what a typical nested model looks like. I'm sure he has no idea, right? It's good to know what the model is. If you understand the model, you understand experimental design. It's that simple. This is the crux of the biscuit, so to speak. Okay? So let's do what we always do. We're going to take subtract mu from both sides of the equation. Okay? So we're going to take yij minus mu is equal to alpha i plus beta j plus epsilon ij. Now we're going to do our parameter estimates. We're going to replace mu with our best estimate of mu, so we're going to take yij minus y bar dot dot. Okay? Now I want to estimate alpha. My best estimate of alpha is going to be yi dot bar minus y bar dot dot, just like last time. That's alpha. Okay? Now I want to estimate beta. That's going to be y dot j bar minus y bar dot dot. There's my best estimate of beta. Plus epsilon. Remember, this plus that plus that must equal that. It's additive. Okay. So if I just write yij minus yi dot bar, it's not going to be right. So let's solve this for epsilon and see what we come up with. So let's subtract these things from both sides. Okay? So I'm going to have yij minus y bar dot dot minus yi dot bar minus y bar dot dot minus y dot j bar minus y bar dot dot is equal to epsilon. I've just subtracted this term from this side, from both sides, and that term from both sides. So now let's see what I get. I get yij minus y bar dot dot minus yi dot bar minus a minus is a plus, so plus y bar dot dot minus y dot j bar plus y bar dot dot. 
equals epsilon. Okay, so I've got y i j minus y bar dot dot plus y bar dot dot, so those two cancel out. So I've got minus y i dot bar minus y dot j bar plus y bar dot dot is equal to epsilon. And you're saying, well, that's weird. No, it's not. Think about what we're doing. When we do the, when we compute a variance, what are we doing? We're taking xi minus x bar quantity squared, adding it all up, and then dividing by n minus 1. It's an observed minus an expected. What are we doing here? An observed minus an expected minus another expected. Yeah. That's not fair. Better add something back in. What do we add in? Our best guess is the overall. So we're going to subtract one, okay, we need to add something back. Okay? Here's another way to think about it. Here, we're going in the i direction. Here, we're going in the j direction. So we're subtracting off the i direction, and then we're subtracting off the j direction. And now we're going to add it back by coming back up the middle. Okay? So in that sense, it's nice and orthogonal. It makes perfect sense. So, in reality, what we've done, we're subtracting off some noise there, we're subtracting off noise there, and then we're adding back the average. So this is going to make epsilon smaller. So all the noise, all the variance, right, from that first model, we're subdividing, we're subdividing this noise that was in here by having blocks, and we're pulling it out of the epsilon term, which is good. That's what we want. So these then are our estimates. So now we can replace epsilon with that term right there, plus that thing. Okay, so. This plus this plus this equals that. So now all we have to do is add both sides up. Okay? Across all i's and j's, we square both sides and add it up across all i's and j's. And, of course, when we square both sides, we're going to end up with all these cross product terms. But, because everything is independent, the cross product terms are going to be equal to zero. So we don't have to worry about them. How did we make sure? Well, we made our little graph, and we saw that nothing overlapped on our little graph. Okay? There will come a time when we're not going to make that assumption. Okay? And we're, very quickly, we're going to run into a case where we're pretty sure that there is some kind of interaction between two groups. And under those circumstances, we're going to figure out how to partition out that model so that we can look at what that interaction is and test whether it's meaningful or not. All right, so because these data are as old as I am, um, and because I obtained this data set back in well, like 1982 or something like that, all these calculations were done by hand. I, I had a, cal a handheld calculator, just sort of an aside. Uh, I was a grad student, my PhD at the University of New Mexico, and uh, right across the street from the university is a cafe called the Frontier Cafe. Uh, and for 69 cents, uh, you could get a cup of coffee and a bowl of green chili stew. That was awesome. 
So I would go over there, and coffee was 25 cents. I would go over there, um, and I would work on the data from my master's thesis, from my PhD thesis, six, seven, eight hours at a time. It's a very noisy place, a lot of traffic, but you could get a booth in a corner and nobody would bother you and nobody would ever ask you to leave. So you could sit there and, and all the computations I did for my PhD dissertation were done by hand. We didn't have computers, we didn't have portable personal computers or anything of that sort. So it's all these initial computations were done with my little Texas Instruments scientific calculator, doing it all by hand. So when you're going to do an ANOVA, you do it by hand. You use the calculator formulas, and in semesters past, I would have shown you what the calculator formulas are, but they simplify everything dramatically. The reason I'm telling you this is because, well, number one, it takes a hell of a lot of time, even with the calculator formulas, and you always run the risk of making a mistake. But the chance of an error with the calculator formulas is less than if you try and do it the traditional way. And I can prove that the calculator formulas are correct. Having said that, your handheld Texas Instrument, you know, scientific calculator does not have the same level of precision that a modern computer does. It doesn't have the bits, right? Your modern computer is a 64-bit machine. These things were probably, what, 12 bits or something like that. So, I mean, it was limited what you could do. So the precision is less. And the result is that when I put these numbers up and you get your numbers in R, they're slightly different. The result doesn't change, but the numbers are slightly different. That difference is because of round off error on the handheld calculator. Okay? If you were to do the same thing in Excel, you would get exactly the right answer. But it's, it's, it's round off error on the calculator. Why do I care? I care because oftentimes when we collect data, we round off. Don't do that. Don't round off your numbers when you put it into the computer. Keep all the digits. Don't round off. Keep all the digits. When you do your statistical analyses, Keep all the digits. Do not round off. You do not round off until you write the paper and try to publish it. That's when you round it off, not before. Okay? Why? Because otherwise, you end up with round off error. And oftentimes, that round off error is sufficient to either take away a result that was meaningful or give you a result that's not meaningful. And you don't want to do that. All right, so our ANOVA table is source. Sum of squares, degrees of freedom. Mean square. Um, and then, oh, there's my expected mean square. There we go. Yeah, expected mean square. And then F computed and F tabled. SAS doesn't give you, or uh, R doesn't give you the, the tabled value, it just gives you the P value, that's fine. You can look up the tabled value in an F table, okay? So, and if you're going to do an analysis of variance when you publish the paper, give the ANOVA table. If the editor says remove it, that's fine, but put it in there. So we have treatment, blocks, error, and total. Okay? So sum of squares is 9.980. Blocks 6.434. We've already done. We've already done this, right? Uh, the the equa I've already shown you what the equation is. Remember when I drew out the model and did the estimates for each? All we have to do is 
added up across all lives in Jason squared, right? So that's no big deal. Um, here we have 1.523, and the total is 17.93. Degrees of freedom, I had three treatments, so I'm estimating alpha, I lose one degree of freedom, right? So I have three minus one is equal to two. For blocks, I had five blocks, I'm estimating beta. I lose one degree of freedom for estimating beta. So I have five minus one is four. Error is a little more complicated. Total, I had how many total observations? I had three treatments and five blocks, so 15, right? So 15 minus one is 14. Where do I lose one degree of freedom? Because I'm estimating mu, okay? So that means then that the error degrees of freedom is eight. Two plus eight plus four is equal to 14. 9.980 divided by two is 4.990. 6.434 divided by four is 1.609. Error, 1.523 divided by eight is 0 0.19. Now the question becomes, what is the appropriate F-test? We have to look at the expected mean square column to know. The expected mean squares for treatment is going to be sigma E squared plus B times sigma A squared. For blocks, it's going to be sigma E squared plus A times sigma B squared. And for error, it's sigma E squared. Now it's obvious what the appropriate F-test is, okay? In some designs in the future, it won't be obvious. So my question now is, what's the appropriate F-test for treatment? What are we trying to do? We're trying to B times B for blocks times sigma A. That's what we're trying to that's what we're trying to isolate. Remember, we want alpha over epsilon. That's the term right there, B times sigma A, right? We have sigma A for block one, two, three, four, five, right? So how do I isolate that term? How do I how do I capture that? What do I divide by what? Well, what's my best estimate of epsilon? Of the, of the variance in epsilon? Right there. Okay. So what happens if I do that? If I take sigma e squared plus b times sigma a squared divided by sigma e squared, that's going to be equal to sigma e squared over sigma e squared plus b sigma a squared divided by sigma e squared. Sigma e over sigma e, that's one. We know theoretically that the f is going to be 1 as yeah. its minimum. So if this is bigger than 1, if, if sigma a is non-zero, if it's anything other than 0, then this is going to be bigger than 1, and we have a difference. So that's the f test. It's going okay. to be 4.990 divided by 0 0.19. So our computed f value then is, where is that page? Our computed f value then 
is 4.96. So four, no, 22.26, 22.26, and the table value is 4.46. And now you say, okay, you've cheated. You already went ahead and looked at the little video clip. You notice in the video clip, when you do this thing in R, that you also get an F value right here. What's that F value? What divided by what? You just kind of do what you did on the one on the planet, don't you? Exactly what I did before. Sigma I'm going to take this divided by that to isolate sigma yeah. b. And that then is going to give me 1.609 divided by 0 0.0 or 0.19. And that value is going to be 8.47. And the table value there is 3.84. And because 22.26 is bigger than 4.46, I know that I have a significant treatment effect. And because 8.47 is bigger than 3.84, I have a significant yeah. block effect. But wait, I did it in red. The question is why? do it in red. Because I don't care. I don't care about no stinking block effect. I didn't do this study yeah. to discover okay. if the I yeah. knew the blocks were different. I don't care about the blocks. Screw the blocks. The heck with the blocks. Don't care. Mm -hmm. I don't want to know. That's not why I did it. Forget that. I'm not even going to compute that nonsense. Don't want it. It's a sin that R gives you that data. Okay? It's because the people at R are obviously frequentists rather than Bayesian. And that is a sin. Frequentists end up in hell. Bayesian probabilists go to heaven. Just I'm just giving you a heads up just so that you know. Okay? Wait, what if, what if this turns out not to be significant and blocks turns out not to be significant? Now what? You went through all this work. Man, your whole thesis depends on this. And if you're my student, it doesn't make any difference. But some professors, they expect you to come up with a significant result. They're wrong. Okay, the results are what the results are. But you've invested a year and a half in collecting these data. You've invested all your all the money you could have been spending on beer, you've spent on materials for your experiment. Late nights in the lab, late nights in the greenhouse, whatever. You've done all this stuff, and you've come, and you've got squat. You don't have anything here that's significant. You don't have anything there that's significant. Now what? Go up to your major professor and say, sorry, man, I'm done. I'm out of here. I got a job at Red Lobster. <laughs> okay? Come in sometime, I'll give you extra good service. What should you do? 
Definitely not that. Well, let's think about what we're doing. What we did was we subdivided epsilon out of, or we subdivided epsilon. We pulled the variance associated with beta out of epsilon. And in doing that, what did we do right here? We took four degrees of freedom away from error and put those degrees of freedom up here. The fact that blocks is not significant, oh, okay. the fact that blocks is not significant tells me there is no block effect. So I've got four degrees of freedom floating around there doing jack. And that to me seems sort of dumb. Let's so put those degrees of freedom to work. What I would do is I would take those four degrees of freedom and say, hey, I'm going to dump those mm -hmm. back in there and give myself 12 degrees of freedom there. And because blocks is not significant, that means that that sum of squares is just another estimate of that sum of squares. So I'm going to put those two things back together. So I'm going to take this beta term and I'm going to return it to epsilon. Get rid of the blocks. And now what happens, now because I have more error degrees of freedom, when I test sigma sub a divided by sigma sub e, I have more degrees of freedom there, meaning that's going to be smaller, and now maybe I'll find a difference. But we live in a Bayesian world. Okay? So what that means is, You've cheated on one level because you already know, right? That there was no block effect. You now know something about the system. So the probabilities have changed. So what you need to do now is be honest with the editor. So when you submit the paper, what you say is, and this is what I tell my students, when you submit the paper, here's what you say. You say, we ran the ANOVA you know, using block treatments and blocks, the block factor was not significant. Therefore, we pulled the block factor back into um, the error term and reran the analysis. And lo and behold, it gave us a significant treatment effect. Now, the editor and the people reading it are either not smart enough to understand what you just said, or they're frequentists and they don't care. But you've been honest. You've said exactly what you've done, okay? In reality, the p-value should probably be 0 0.025 rather than 0 0.05, and you're fine, okay? All right. That is the randomized complete block design. Things get fun. Right? Um, this is pretty straightforward and simple. Things get fun when you have a really big experiment. For example, maybe you work for the Centers for Disease Control. I, have, I know this uh, woman, uh, for her dissertation, she worked on body temperatures in beaver. Uh, and she showed that um, body temperatures in beaver are not what you think they are. And she had this wonderful statistical analysis and we'll do that kind of analysis later on in the semester. But she pointed out that a temperature now is not independent of the temperature that you were an hour ago. They, they are dependent. So this wonderful statistical trick that she employed. Well, now she works for the Centers for Disease Control as a statistical analyst. They have huge experiments. So in experiments involving tens of thousands of people, OK? And they're setting up these complicated ANOVA designs, which is exactly what they're doing for the COVID vaccine. Right? It's complicated. But because, because of the nature of the beast, you can't have every possible block filled. So you don't have every block treatment combination filled. We had a nice balanced design. Every block had the same number of observations. Every treatment had the same number of observations. Sometimes you don't get that. 
So there is a design called a randomized incomplete block design. So you can figure out ways to have some blocks that are empty, some block treatment combinations that are empty while others are full. And in doing that, you can still run the analysis and still find out what, which blocks are important, which treatments are important. You can still do it. But it requires sitting down and working out, working on the model, and figuring out where you can afford to sacrifice some of those cells. Does it have less statistical power? No, actually it turns out to be incredibly powerful. All right. So it is, it's, it's a very cool little statistical trick, but it requires, like most experiments, you can do one of two things. You can put all the work in ahead of time and have an easy time on the back end, or you can have an easy time on the front end and do all your hard work on the back end. So it's financially, intellectually, and scientifically, it's better to put in the work beforehand to plan it out than have an easy time later on. Okay? All right, when we come back next week, uh, we're going to stay with uh, one way at Ovis. We're going to do a Latin square design, and we will also do a nested design. Okay? And after we've done that, then we're going to move on to what are called cross-classification designs, uh, which are two-way, three-way ANOVAs. Uh, we'll probably spend at least one uh, lecture on those cross-classification designs. And once we've done that, we're going to walk away from ANOVA, and we're going to start doing regression modeling. OK? All right, that's all we got for today. See you guys again next week.